Hey everybody, and welcome to episode three of Rethinking with Alex Torpy. Um, happy to be joining you on this uh, snow day here. Uh, this is one of the first snow days in uh, almost a decade that um, I haven't had to work. Um, and uh, you know, I'll never forget, uh, I had a public works director retire uh, one year and uh, I remember asking him you know, you know, what he was just looking forward to the most in his retirement. Um, and he mentioned that for the first time in 35 years, he was looking forward to a snow day that he could sleep in for. Um, so if you see a public works person out there, um, you know, plowing the streets, just give them a little thumbs up or say thank you. I think those underappreciated people, to say the least, um, for the amount of work they do. So anyway, um, what we're talking about a little bit this week um, is uh, some of the problems with the way that we have conversations um, and then a promise that I'm going to make to you all about how I'm going to approach presenting you information um, uh, in this series, on this podcast. So I think most of us kind of understand generally that we're not having good conversations uh, these days. About 50% of Republicans think that Democrats are closed-minded, and about 70% of Democrats think that Republicans are closed-minded. Um, this is from the Pew Research Foundation, who has compiled a lot of interesting numbers over the last couple decades, um, especially on Americans' view of partisanship um, and divisiveness and, and things like that. Um, and so everybody's closed-minded. All right. Everybody thinks everybody else is closed-minded. Um, and there are a lot of other negative words associated with how people saw the opposing party from that research as well. And the bottom line um, is that one of the uh, assumptions, one of the things that we'll get into in uh, one of the next couple episodes um, is that there is no person or group that is right. Um, that is a, uh, an assumption that I am taking um, in my life and in how I present this information to you all. There's not just one group who got it all right and everybody else was wrong. Um, there's difference, there, are, there are things that different people are bringing to discussions that uh, there are different viewpoints that are valid and offer value, uh, but there's not one type of person or group of people that's just got a monopoly on being right. If that's the case, though, we need to take this a few steps further. If that's the case and anybody can potentially be right about anything, then we need to have a framework for how to have conversations with people that we disagree with. We're going to talk about this a lot in future episodes, how this sort of um, mindset of monopolizing, having a monopoly on the truth um, is one of the really destructive forces in our civic society and our political discourse. Um, and that's not what I'm going to be doing here. Um, and it's not what I personally believe. Um, and so on a broad scale, I think we're seeing uh, not just that people are frustrated with the quote unquote opposing side, but actually that some of that data shows that the degree of frustration is also increasing. So people are getting more frustrated at people that they think uh, don't understand something that's happening or, um, or who they disagree with. Um, that's a really big problem that we'll come back to in a little bit. Um, there's a couple things that I want to go through uh, that provide a little bit of an interesting perspective on how to maybe have better conversations. And some of these are going to get followed up with in more detail in future episodes, but I wanted to introduce a couple of them as part of my discussion of how I'm going to be presenting information to you so that you can decide how you trust what you hear from me. All right, so the first is um, a blog post that I'm going to be linking to um, uh, from this episode that is uh, um, a sort of interesting, um, interesting post about the sort of different levels that people tend to argue. And for anybody who's taken the LSAT or gone to law school or you know, had a logic course, some of this might uh, be a little familiar. But for those of you who haven't, this is really, really important to think about. So this blog post, I don't think that they necessarily got it all right. But it's a really good overview and a really good illustration of some of these points. So I'll put up on screen, what for those that are watching, what I'm talking about. Um, and what it is is the varieties of argumentation experience. Um, and this was based off of an earlier book that the blog post author um, uh, was referencing. And so I'll just run through this quickly because I think this sets it up pretty nicely. So 
there's this pyramid of the kind of levels of um, argumentation or debate or discourse that you can have with someone. At the bottom is name calling, or the blog post author will talk about it as social shaming. You know, I think we all know what this sounds like. Um, this is the least productive way to engage in a topic with somebody else. The next up is the ad hominem attacks. So these are attacks on the character or authority or credibility of the person without actually addressing anything that they've said. Um, the next is responding to tone. So this is a criticism of the tone of the other person, um, but without, again, without addressing the substance or content of what they said. This is one that I've run into a lot. For those of you who know me, I'm sure you won't find that a surprise. Um, but it is a, it is a method for someone to dismiss the argument of someone else without actually introducing any information or evidence, right? You are, at this point, you're either calling the person a name, you are attacking their personality or credibility, or you're dismissing them because of their tone. We haven't even gotten to any of the substance yet. The next level up on the pyramid is a contradiction, which is starting to go in the right direction. So now what the person is doing is stating their difference of opinion. They haven't provided evidence, they haven't refuted any points, but they have stated content, right? They have stated their difference of opinion or their different understanding of a fact. Next up might be a counter argument. And so this is something that contradicts the original point or other person and then um, backs it up with some supporting evidence or reasoning. The next up is a refutation. So this is finding a specific mistake in logic or evidence that the other person made and providing your own um, as a way to back up your argument. And the next up is refuting the central point. These were all taken from uh, a book called How to Disagree Better. Um, and then the author of this uh, post um, you know, has kind of their own pyramid where they have social shaming at the bottom. They call them gotchas as the next level up, which I think we're all familiar with. And then there's the discussion of a single fact or a single point of information, a discussion of a single study above that, a discussion of a meta study above that, or a good faith survey of existing studies, um, and then high level kind of uh, generators of disagreement that are often very philosophical or abstract in nature. So again, I'll show these to you. I'll give you the links. Not suggesting these are 100% right, but it's good context for just remembering and reflecting that as we engage in debate and as we discuss with other people, we're basically in one of those types of categories. And you want to be as close to the top of that as possible um, and avoid the sort of social shaming, name calling, um, attacking people's personality or tone and really try to stick to the stick to the substance of the issue that you're discussing. So that's one thing that's sort of an interesting context or resource that I encourage you to go check out in more detail. The next is something called motivational interviewing. We're going to be going into this more in a future episode because I'm going to be bringing a practitioner or two of this um, onto the podcast to uh, talk about it. But I wanted to mention it today. Uh, I wanted to introduce it today. Um, so this is something I came across when I was writing my thesis um, in college about the drinking age and alcohol policy. This was originally developed over the last couple decades as a sort of substance abuse methodology in the healthcare setting where it was meant to transition away from, to provide a more effective framework for somebody who is, let's say, addicted to alcohol or drugs. And instead of using social pressure to force them to change their opinion, motivational interviewing is a sort of conversational framework based on respecting the agency of the other person to come to their own conclusions and decide their own fate with their own behaviors. And the idea of the methodology is to ask people questions and talk to them and help them reflect on um, basically uh, their own ideas so that they get to a point where they realize that their values and their actions might not be aligned. Um, but they're coming to that conclusion on their own with you assisting them um, and supporting them in doing so. It's a very different way to approach the conversations. And this methodology, I incorporated this methodology into a program that I designed for a nonprofit called Run for America several years ago, where we created a program called Pathways for America that was a leadership development program aimed to get people, help get people to run for office. This is a bipartisan program. There's many other programs um, out there like that, many of them rely on sort of the social pressure model, um, trying to convince the person 
you know, things are urgent, we need you, the time is now, things like that to try and get the person to agree to do something. However, what you may often find with that is that the person agreed without really being internally motivated. So we ended up designing a, a relatively successful program, met many of our benchmarks, um, uh, that was built on not trying to convince someone to run for office, but trying to help them think through the question, our belief being that most people, if given the opportunity to think through that in detail, they will actually come to the conclusion more often than not that running for office is a potentially valuable way for them to get involved. If you're confident in your argument, right, we take this framework with most people, we hear something um, that we disagree with, we hear someone say something that offends us, and our response is to say, hey, buddy, you're wrong and I'm right and here's why. In the best case scenario, right? Well, that's already a couple levels up in that pyramid. We skipped all the name calling. And so um, that model often doesn't work. If you've ever argued with somebody on the internet or a uh, family member over the holidays, you'll find that just trying to force your opinion down their throat often doesn't work and often actually ends up getting people to dig in further. And there is some research to suggest that that is what is happening. So motivational interviewing offers a different perspective because what it offers is a framework that allows you to talk to somebody else f to feel different about something than they do, accept their agency as an individual person who has a right to their own way of looking at things, their own background of how they came to that opinion, and all the other factors that are beyond your awareness. That they have that and respect that about them, but try to help them really be critical and really be reflective um, of the opinion that they have with the hope that they end up in a better place. Um, and if you're confident in your argument, right, you would like to think that by providing other people more information, more evidence, the opportunity to think critically, that they'll end up where you are. You don't need to force them if you're right. Um, and so motivational interviewing offers a framework, I believe, for having more empathetic conversations. Even though it was developed as a healthcare methodology, there are actually a number of nonprofits um, that use this as sort of a framework to have better conversations with people that you disagree with or as a way as a conflict resolution framework. So I'm gonna be bringing on some people from those organizations to talk about this in future episodes. So I'll leave it there for now. But that's the second piece of context I wanted to bring in in talking about how to have better conversations and the problem with our discourse currently. The next thing, um, which is kind of a fun one, is um, a bunch of seven different principles that I'm going to actually make as commitments to all of you about how I'm going to approach the information that I provide in this podcast and series. You know, I thought about a couple different ways of how to uh, show you what my intentions were so that you can think about how best to engage with uh, what I'm presenting with you. You know, That's up to you to decide how or whether you trust me or not, but I'm going to tell you the framework that I'm gonna use um, uh, with, uh, with how I approach this. Um, and this is a framework that I discovered in college, um, and it was created by one of the former presidents um, of Hampshire College. And so, got to forgive the language is a, a little academic, a little collegiate, as is to sort of be expected for something like this. Um, but Gregory Prince, who was a, a president at Hampshire College, came up with this, these seven principles of discourse. Um, these were very useful as we facilitated conversations during student government in Hampshire. They've been a part of my life since then, sort of a, a, a guiding framework uh, with how I want to approach my research, my discussions, and the work product that I create, um, and how I engage with people that I disagree with. So I'll read you out the seven principles here, and I'm also going to include a link to them so that you can go find out a little bit more about them. We're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail in a future episode. I think you'll find that most of these are pretty self-explanatory. Here we go. Number one, that we value truth and the process of seeking truth as ends in themselves. So you're not just using truth to get at something, but using truth is one of the goals. That's number one. Number two, that we accept responsibility to articulate a position as close to the truth as, we, as one can make it, using to the best of one's ability 
available evidence and the rules of reason, logic, and relevance. So this is how we are each approaching the conversation. That is our framework, articulating a position as close to the truth as possible. Number three, that we listen openly, recognizing always that new information may alter one's position. This is so important, something that very that a lot of people don't do. Sometimes we think, I think in our personal lives, we look at people who don't accept new information as being stubborn, but somehow in the political world, those people get rewarded. Um, and so this is a really important one, that new information, it doesn't have to change your opinion, but you have to be prepared for new information to change your opinion. Number four, that we welcome evaluation and accept and even encourage disagreement and criticism, even to the point of seeking out for ourselves that which will disprove our own position. Again, can't emphasize how important this is, how much harder it is to do this in practice, and how few leaders actually do this rather than create positive feedback loops that just reinforce the things they already thought they were right about. We have to be proactive about inviting people to disagree with us. That will ultimately make our arguments stronger, and it's a great way when you're having a debate with somebody, you steel man each other's arguments, meaning if I'm arguing with somebody else, I have the responsibility of arguing their position in their terms to start the discussion, and they do the same with me. Um, and it's really important to sort of seek that out. Um, don't just wait for it. Number five, that we refuse to reduce disagreement to personal attacks or attacks on groups or classes of individuals. This is the bottom couple sections of those pyramids. This is so important. How much of our discourse gets uh, warped in this way? And I'll be honest, when I see people attacking other people, in discussions, that is a huge red flag for me that the person doesn't have a strong argument on their side. Number six, that we value civility even in disagreement. Again, unless you think that there's only one group that's right and that all other people are wrong and that by virtue of being wrong, they don't get to be respected as individuals, you have to include this in the way that you approach these conversations, right? Disagreement is not a bad thing. Disagreement, in fact, I will argue, um, and we'll talk about more, disagreement is a critical component to creating a system that is likely to get you to the best possible solutions. And if you're going to build disagreement in, we should build civility in too. Number seven, that we reject the premise that the ends, no matter how worthy, can justify means which violate these principles. This is critically important. So much minor and major suffering has been done throughout the world at the hands of people who did horrific things and justified doing those horrific things because they thought they were right. You can't use that as a way to justify how you go about doing the things that you're doing because it is the same argument that uh, some of the worst individuals um, throughout human history have done. Um, you have to be able to have means that will be respectable even if your ends actually end up being wrong. You can't allow the ends to justify the means. So these seven principles of discourse, I think, are a pretty good framework for how I'm going to approach presenting information to you in this podcast, um, that I commit to sticking to each of these. So we've covered a couple things today. We talked a little bit about um, the varieties of argumentation experience, which I'm going to link you to, um, just making sure that we understand how we're engaging when we are debating or discussing with somebody or presenting information. Um, and being mindful about always trying to go higher up on that pyramid to more constructive ways of argument. We talked a little bit about motivational interviewing, the substance abuse and healthcare methodology that actually may offer us a framework for having better conversations with people that we disagree with that we're going to go into more in a future episode. And then we talked a little bit about the principles of discourse, not only an interesting model that you may want to incorporate into your own workspaces, 
um, but it is a way, an easy way for me to summarize my commitment to all of you about how I'm going to be presenting information um, on this podcast. So I hope this has been interesting. Um, I, I encourage you to check out the links here, um, and uh, those will all be available at rethinkingwithalextorpy.com. Really excited for the next episodes that are going to be coming up soon now that we've gotten some of this um, kind of set up here. Um, there's going to be some really interesting interdisciplinary content that uh, we're going to be bringing in some uh, pretty fun topics from evolutionary biology um, and neuroscience. We're going to start talking about uh, some interesting ways that we behave and make decisions. So I hope you'll tune into those as well. Make sure to subscribe to the email list at rethinkingwithalextorpy.com because that will also be your invitation um, to the monthly video chats where you can meet other people and dive into some of these topics in more detail. So I really appreciate you joining and listening and watching. Let me know what you think about today's episode and where is some place that you can incorporate some of these principles of discourse in your professional or personal life. So thanks again for joining me on Rethinking, and I'll talk to all of you real soon.